I'm a physician scientist here at the Fred Hutch. Now, as a frontline cancer doctor, I have seen the devastating effects of cancer metastasis on many patients, in particular prostate cancer. But over the years, one particular patient has really stood out. His name was Andy. Andy married his high school sweetheart. They had three beautiful children, all of whom he adored. But when he turned 54 years old, he was diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer. And what that means is that the prostate cancer had already spread all over, all over his body when I saw him. And so over two years, I treated him. But there was a very common theme that arose during this treatment. It went something like this. I gave him one set of therapies. They'd work for a little bit, and then they stopped working. I gave him another set of therapies. Those would work as well, but then they stopped working. And so we went through quite a few iterations of this. But unfortunately, shortly before his 56th birthday, 56th birthday, Andy died. Andy's wife, Donna, she gave me a call uh, when this occurred. But what she said after she shared the news with me has really haunted me to this day. She said, Andy really had great respect for the, my clinical judgment and the care that I gave him. Now, why would that be haunting? Well, the reason why it was so haunting to me is that despite my best medical judgment and despite having the most powerful, newest, most impactful drugs for prostate cancer available to mankind, Andy still died. So many of you in this room uh, probably know of or have loved ones such as fathers, brothers, grandfathers, or maybe even husbands who've been afflicted with prostate cancer. Now let me tell you though, being a frontline doctor, I know, a prostate cancer doctor, I know that there have been a number of new therapies that have come out for prostate cancer. It's been a very exciting field to, be a, a, to see patients with. But all of these therapies share the same theme that Andy and I wrestled with, which is I'd give, we'd give one therapy and then they stop working. So what we're really talking about here is life extension, but not cures. As a result, prostate cancer remains the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States and in the developed world. And if a patient comes in with metastatic prostate cancer, just like what Andy had, it's a terminal diagnosis. So prostate cancer is a scourge to our society. And what we need are alternative approaches. Now, traditionally, people have looked at cancer as a disease of mutations within the DNA and the RNA. And to a certain extent, that's actually very true. But DNA and RNA are not the building blocks of life. Proteins are. It's kind of like the difference between like a recipe book, which would be the DNA RNA, versus an entire meal, which would be the proteins. And yet, despite the fact that we know that proteins are so important and central to human life, very little in terms of resources have been put into study how the way cells make proteins can actually lead to and drive cancers. But this is changing. And in fact, over the past decade, there's been an explosion in this field. And I'm excited to say that I've been part of this growing movement. In fact, over the past seven years, my laboratory has developed some of the most innovative strategies and technologies to actually study how cancer cells make proteins very differently from normal cells. And what we've discovered has been remarkable. We now know that cancer cells can actually make very specific proteins, not all proteins, but very specific proteins at very high levels. And the reason why these are important is because they help the cancer cells survive. So they're essentially addicted to these proteins. Now, why would they need to make survival proteins? It's cancer, right? Well, it turns out cancers, as they're developing into tumors, what happens is that there are forces inside the tumor and outside their tumor that are telling the cancer cells to die, to shut off and die. But in defiance of these signals, cancer cells, what they do is they make these addictive proteins. And what happens there is the cancer cells survive, they thrive, and ultimately they spread and metastasize and cause issues for patients just like my patient Andy. But there was another big discovery that came from my laboratory. And that's that we now actually have, and we've discovered, a small group of compounds or drugs that we can actually use to treat the making of these addictive proteins. What we know now is we take these compounds and put them onto cancer cells, the cancer cells die. We know that tumors themselves, they shrink very, very significantly. But this work, this very important work, was done in cell lines and in mice. And of course, now what we need to know is whether or not the same things hold true for patients with prostate cancer. 
given this tremendous opportunity we have at the Fred Hutch, right here, right now, what we need to do, the next important steps, are for us to understand how and why cancer cells make these addictive proteins in the first place. And we need to take that small arsenal of drugs that we have, and we need to put them into clinical trials for prostate cancer patients now. So to this end, what I've done is I've used my significant experience, both as a frontline cancer doc, as well as a basic science researcher, to assemble a stellar team to address both of these questions. So first, the work at the bench side. My team is, has the technologies and the know-how to study how and why cancer cells make addictive proteins in the first place. And the reason why these fundamental questions are really important to address is because our work will lay the groundwork for the next generation, next wave of therapies that can actually target the making of these addictive proteins. But that's not the only reason why it's important. The other reason why this work is important is because it will help us to identify the specific patients that will benefit the most from these types of drugs. So we actually tailor the therapy to individual patients. But this is not enough. We need solutions now. And as I already said, we're at a very, very special time in history because for the first time ever, we actually have a handful of drugs that can target these addictive proteins. And so, of course, what we need to do is we need testament patients. And to do this, what I've done is I partnered with some of the best clinical trialists in the nation. And I'm happy to say they're actually right here across the street at the SCCA, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. So what we're doing right now is that we are generating some of the very first clinical trials to target these addictive proteins in prostate cancer patients. So I ask that you would join me as we attempt to shift the tide of cancer care from life extension to potential cures so that patients like Andy could have another day, week, month, years, maybe even a lifetime to share with his family and loved ones. Thank you very much.